Today we will talk about some intricate signals uh, that we meet in the EMG laboratory. Let's start with uh, the motor conduction velocity uh, studies, particularly cursor settings. Here is a routine uh, recording where we have the distal and the proximal responses with the automatically set cursors. If we increase the gain, we see the uh, pre-motor potential here, but here is the setting for the cursor at the uh, place where the signal is turning in negative direction. And here we may have uncertainties because there is al always or often some small signals uh, in the early phase here. Is it uh, going to be set here or should it be here or where? A good rule is to measure on symmetric points of the signal, for example, half a millivolt uh, up in negative direction or even the peak, and then we get the latency from here and can calculate the velocity. If we move this line down here and we have a correct distal setting, we can see where the optimal setting is for the proximal situation. But uh, as I said, the conduction velocity can be uh, calculated from uh, this uh, time interval. By superimposing the signals in relation to the takeoff cursors, they align completely if the cursors are set on the correct place. Here is a situation that we all know that if we have a good position of the E1 uh, then we have a negative takeoff. If we move the electrode a little away from the end plate zone then we will have an initial uh, positivity here an arriving part of the signals and if we move it even further away then the uh, time latency here will be longer. We should all try to get a correct position with as good position uh, uh, with the negative takeoff as possible. Here is the result of of these problems. We have uh, erroneous setting here and here the signals are identical from distal and proximal stimulation. This is the time when the nerve signal reaches the muscle, the end plate, and that is when the signal starts to go away from the baseline. So this is the distal latency, the theoretical and also uh, the practical uh, part. For conduction velocity, we may have some uncertainties here and here. So then it's allowed to use any part of the signal on symmetric points of the signal for uh, calculating the conduction velocity. Here I've set it to the, uh, the um, positive peak here, the positive peak here. So usually the conduction velocity can be calculated very uh, accurately uh, and we may have problems with the distal latency. This is when the signals are identical more or less. Here is another situation where we have a very good signal at the proximal stimulation but we have an other shape at the this was distal stimulation and here is a proximal stimulation where for example in median stimulation we have early components here in the, the positive going direction and this is the volume conducted activity from forearm muscles. In this situation we measure the distal latency to this takeoff but for conduction velocity we use symmetric points here and one way to do that is to superimpose. Now I place the blue signal here and you can see that this is the blue takeoff and this one is the, the similar uh, takeoff for, for the proximal stimulation. You can consider this as a new baseline and this is the first takeoff from the baseline. 
and this is based on an absolute superimposition of the signals. <clears throat> Here's the same thing again, uh, a real recording with the distal proximal and we, uh, we align them uh, vertically and you see that they are slightly different. Obviously I had not set the cursors correctly. Uh, these are aligned according to the cursor setting. If we now move the, the uh, proximal cursor just a little we could get them superimposed and use this uh, uh, time setting for the cursors for calculating the conduction velocity. 58 meters and now after correction it became 53 meters so a slight uh, difference. Then a few words about A waves. They were initially initially named X, uh, A wave because it was considered to be an axon reflex with the branching of a nerve that we stimulated here and we got the C map this way and we get the late component this way. This is not a very common situation at all. More common is a hyperexcitable area in a nerve uh, axon. Uh, another possibility is effective transmission from one nerve axon to another axon. Here, when we stimulate here, the signal goes in both out to the muscle directly and then up to the hyperexcitable zone and then out again as a later component. But there is also a completely different thing when we have abnormal conduction in the very distal part of the nerve, CIDP for example, with demyelination and very pronounced slowing of velocities uh, when we stimulate here, we, we get late components because of, of the, the slow conduction here. So how can we separate A waves from uh, CMAP um, satellites? Here you have a, a stimulation with CMAP here and uh, all these late components with stable shape and uh, latency. Here is one with stable shape and latency at this position and also a small one here like this. Well uh, I have a couple of methods to, to show which has been described uh, many times earlier uh, namely that we move the stimulating electrode a few centimeters proximally. In that uh, case we have a slightly longer latency to the C map, but a slightly shorter latency to the A wave because of this distance is shorter. So if C map latency increases and late component latency decreases, then we have to do with the A wave. If we ha have the situation with the satellite, then and moving the electrode again, then we will have a longer latency to the C map and also to the late components. We increase in both, and that is C map satellite. Here you have such an example with a complex recording from the tibial um, nerve. We have moved the stimulating electrode approximately a few centimeters here, here here and here. The latency increases for the C map and here you have a, a component where the latency is like this and here is a little later. So this must be a C map satellite. But another component here becomes shorter and shorter. So this is an A wave. So during the same recording we have both some uh, A waves and some CMAP uh, satellites. Another method to separate A wave and CMAP satellite is by uh, double stimulation. When we stimulate once then it's okay a late component but if we uh, uh, stimulate two times 
with an interval of say 3 milliseconds then the second stimulation will block the response from the first stimulation and we will not get any late component at all. If we however give three stimuli then we uh, the coast is clear after the two first stimuli and now we can uh, g give, get the response. If we get four, then no response. If we give five, we get one response, the counting axon. And the other situation, double stimulation for the CMAP satellite, then we will, will get responses to uh, both of the stimuli. Here's an example of a single stimulation, late components, double stimulation, no late components at all. In the uh, tibial nerve, where we particularly often have these late components, we have both A waves and particularly CMAP uh, satellites. The A waves that are generated distal to the uh, stimulator are not seen in the, uh, in the recording with the following situation. Here you have the stimulation and here we have a hyper excitable zone and here are some normal axons. The time from here and the whole way here is about the same as the time uh, from um, in the uh, normal axon. This may add some uh, part of a m some millisecond to, to, to the delay uh, if it is generated again um, and, and uh, still f uh, follow, follow uh, or occur within the CMAP. So we did not see this because the response comes inside the CMAP. Here we stimulate the number of healthy axons and they occur with a slight variation to the muscle. But uh, if, uh, if we have a hyper excitable zone with a return signal, returning signal, then that one will come a little later and occur after the uh, C map. So we only see A waves in principle that uh, are uh, sitting proximally to the stimulation. Here we have example with with many late components and we have the same shape of, of late components in distal and proximal positions so I'm pretty sure that these are CMAP satellites without having tested that uh, further. Sanjeev Nandilkar and Paul Barkhaus and myself have um, been uh, thinking very much about the saying that uh, the early part of the CMAP represents the fastest axons. We are not absolutely sure about that any longer uh, and uh, we have work in progress but I want to, to point to a, a few uh, facts here. Namely, if we superimpose the CMAP from proximal and distal stimulation, very often the duration is nearly exactly the same. Here you see exactly the same, very similar we are surprised how, how similar they are. These are other nerves, leg nerves, you see absolutely, and not here, but here, and here, and here. And uh, this uh, similarity between the distal and proximal uh, response does not fit to the theory that the early part of the CMAP should be represented by fast axons and the later part of the CMAP should be uh, mainly represented by the slow conducting axons. Uh, we have other uh, uh, experiments to, to uh, support that uh, idea also that uh, it's a mixture of velocities in, in the CMAP. And maybe we can, and here you see it from median nerve 
proximal and distal, how, how, how very similar they are, each of them, when we uh, uh, display them superimposed. Maybe we can explain it in the following way. Here is a, a group of axons and we stimulate up here. And here is the wrist uh, where we see that the signals arrive with a slight variation in time uh, corresponding to the conduction velocity in the different uh, axons. And they should now go to the distal part and theoretically they should occur here with this distance and this velocity this one should occur here and so on and so forth they should uh, give a uh, distal C map of, of this length but that is not true the uh, uh, the anatomy will change a little the uh, axons will be thinner to, to various degree and therefore we have a longer latency than expected that is called terminal latency and this uh, difference the terminal latency for each of the axons will vary uh, so that the the order is completely changed uh, uh, distally so maybe we can say it looks like a, a steeplechase run where the uh, runners reach the barrier according to their capacity of running but when they jump into the water they may trip and fall and uh, therefore the the order of, of arrival time here will vary quite extensively and therefore we will not have only the absolute fastest but um, depending on other uh, situations the, the the winner will be um, someone unexpected I'm going to uh, show uh, two types of double discharges one is uh, generated in the neuron and one is generated in the axon first in the neuron here is firing rate of uh, one uh, motor unit with a, a slight voluntary activity and if we then make a pause here that can be uh, for example 5 to 10 seconds or even shorter the first signal that occurs after the pause is very often a double discharge in a normal muscle uh, this is also has uh, some bearing on on the the twitch tension, which is an extra kick to start a movement. And mm, the reason may be the following: when a neuron starts to activate, it it goes with a high frequency, but that is inhibited by the negative feedback from the Renshaw inhibition, and therefore the output later will be a slower uh, firing rate. But a few of the early discharges may um, escape from this inhibition before the inhibition has taken place. And this is the uh, escape of uh, one extra discharge. And the interval between these two uh, reflects the interval at the initial high firing rate. This is uh, something that you can see every day when you do EMG and make a small pause. Here you have an example of recording where we have motor unit potential here occurring with regular frequency and then a long pause from here and goes on like this and then the first signal here that occurs is a double, double discharge and in this particular recording it happened many times. When we superimpose them, we can see that the extra discharge amplitude varies a little dependent on the, the interval between the original and the extra discharge. Uh, the extra discharge is here falling um, within the relative refractory period. Here is another type of double discharge a complex recording in a patient with ALS that now and then gives an extra discharge during voluntary contraction and you say well they are not absolutely identical here no it's true um, 
and this is falling within the relative refractory period and uh, therefore individual components may be missing or have changed in shape a little but if we move the electrode such that that some spikes increasing in amplitude and others go down that is reflected completely nicely in the extra discharge so we can s show that it is the same another thing that happens here is that th that uh, there is an interval uh, in the in the uh, of, after the uh, fi firing of an extra discharge then we have a little pause here so this is something that we see in neurogenic uh, conditions double motor end plates can sometimes be seen in the biopsy and we can wonder if we can see that electrophysiologically here we have one neuron with some branches and connected to one motor end plate here and two motor end plates on one fiber here when we do the recording with voluntary contraction we see activity from motor end plate one and two not from three because that activity here is blocked by activity from number two but if number two here for example in myasthenia or reinnervation is now and then blocked then we see a longer latency all of a sudden so we will see jumps in the uh, interval between the two uh, spikes and uh, that that is the sign of two motor ram plates here is another situation where we have two neurons that form uh, each of them one end plate each on a given muscle fiber if we do a voluntary contraction and activate both neurons they have different firing rate and we'll see a very irregular rate here but if we do vo uh, electric stimulation strong enough to activate both uh, uh, motor end plates here then we will have this situation we normally only get number one that is recorded here but if that one is sometimes blocked for example in myasthenia where we have seen this then we all of a sudden are able to see the response from number two with identical shape but a slightly longer latency so we have seen a few of these uh, funny and little intricate signals uh, that we uh, meet in the EMG lab but uh, uh, they may not have any uh, bearing on interpretation of our signals at all but it can be good to know something about the physiology behind their occurrence uh, and uh, understand a little more of specifics in the EMG. Thank you.